Today we're going to look at the way that buildings cope with the sort of weather we get in this country. It can't be easy for them. Back in the 18th century, Samuel Johnson said that when two Englishmen meet, their first talk is of the, uh, of the weather. The reason for this is obvious enough. We just have more of it than anybody else. Consider for a moment or two my local weatherman, the beloved Bob Johnson. Well, we can certainly start worrying about skitey bits because today's weather is going to be even warmer than yesterday's weather and tomorrow's weather is going to be warmer than today. In fact, a week on Tuesday, I'm going down to Teesdale to the annual Rat Breeders' Convention and phew, it's going to be a scorcher. Oh, oh sorry. I went into a total fantasy then. It was but a dream. This is what Bob's normally like. I said this morning it was too glitty to bide. Now look at it, the weather's gone down the drain. Thunder plumps. Guy Dreech over the Rothbury Moors. Another top coat's worth up there. And it's degging it down at Darlington. It's windy fit to blow your heat off. It's cold out there, extra socks, extra sennets. It's true, isn't it? We just have more weather than anybody else. For example, if I come up for a picnic on the beach on a nice July afternoon, I come prepared for all eventualities. T-shirt, of course. Without a T-shirt, I bring my swimming trunks, of course. And a knotted hanky to protect me from the pitiless heat of the noonday sun. Uh, anorak. Oh, you'd be mad to come up the coast without an anorak. Shovel, just in case the car gets stuck in the snow on the way home. You see, you can't trust the British weather. I asked Bob why it was so changeable. Well, it's very simple, really. We're an island at the edge of an ocean, at the edge of the continent of Europe. And when the winds come in off the ocean, they're moist. They keep us mild in the winter. They keep us coolish in the summer. When they're coming off the continent, they keep us very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. If you throw in the hills and the moors and the mountains, that's where we get our rain, our mists and our hars from. When they both meet over the top of us, by jings, we get downpours, we get floods. We're doomed. So there you are, it's official. Britain is well weathered. And the question this programme is going to ask is this. What do our buildings do about it? I've come to Swaledale in North Yorkshire to find out. This is a pretty good place to come because if England as a whole gets lots of weather, this place gets lots more. It may be beautiful today, aren't we lucky, but it's high up and it can be cold and wet. It's often snowy and windy too. No, any building that gets put up up here has to take weather pretty seriously. And most of them do. In cold, difficult places like this, houses needed to be strong enough to keep the weather out. Walls needed to be thick to withstand wind and rain and probably floods as well. Windows needed to be pretty small. I suspect that you would be less interested in the view than in keeping the heat in and most of the older houses had tiny windows, though a lot of them have been made bigger more recently. Roofs. Roofs, well, they needed to be heavy enough to stay on. You wouldn't want to be left exposed and roofless up here. 
and they needed to stick out a bit beyond the wall so that the water could drip off. So you needed a good big roof. If you happened to live in an area where there was good roofing stone like this, you were lucky. This is sandstone. It looks beautiful, of course, as if the house has just reared up out of the ground. It's heavy so it won't blow away, and it's waterproof too. What more could you ask for? Slate, for example. Slate's got all of the qualities of sandstone, except it's more durable, at least it's more water resistant, and it splits more finely so that it's lighter and easier to hold up and cheaper to build. Great stuff, slate. But not up here in Swaledale. This is sandstone country, and one of its glories is its good solid stone roofs. Okay. What other ways are there to make buildings suitable for local conditions? Well, there are lots of them. There are hood moulds, for example. This decorative strip above the window is designed to look nice, of course, to finish the window off just so. But it's also meant to throw the water clear of the wall to stop it soaking through the surface. Decorative and clever. If only the rest of us could say the same. Weathered pointing. Now that's really clever, even though it looks very ordinary. This is weathered pointing. What happens is that each course is laid at a sort of angle, so that the top of it slightly overhangs the course beneath. And as the water runs down, some of it at least is supposed to be thrown clear of the wall. A cunning wheeze. So, building materials and styles of building are important, but as they say, there's more. More to living up here than that. You can add to your comfort by sharing your buildings with others. If you want a bit of extra warmth, there's nothing like snuggling up to the animals. This is a lathe. Or maybe I should call it a lathe house. I'm not sure. Lathe's a Yorkshire word, but this particular style of farm buildings is common all over the upland areas of northern Britain. You've got the people at one end, and originally at least, you've got the animals at the other. In an earlier series, we visited the Rydale Folk Museum at Huttonley Hole in the North York Moors and filmed a reconstruction of a longhouse, a medieval style of house where the people and the animals shared the same space and very friendly they were at times, I believe. There were probably some disadvantages in terms of who got first shout at the bathroom and who sat nearest the fire and so on, but the advantage of a house like that in a world before double glazing is pretty obvious. Now I've got my cows to keep me warm. Well, there are no surviving longhouses, but these lathes have got some of the same qualities. It's not unlike my house, which is a terrace house, and I'm sure that I'm kept warmer by the fact that the neighbours snuggle in next door. Well, there are no neighbours here, but there are plenty of animals, hens and sheep and cows, to impart a bit of neighbourly warmth. Everything I've said so far is probably less important than the very first decision you take when you build a house. Where should I put it? In a mountainous district like this, it pays to snuggle it in against the landscape, to get as close as possible to the ground. The ground may not be roasting hot, but it's positively cosy by comparison to what comes out of the sky. If possible, you should face south, because that's where most of the sun is. You need to get as much natural light and heat as there is available. On the north side, a lot of the older buildings in the hills barely have any openings at all. Suck the heat in from the sun and keep as much of it inside as possible. That's the motto. It's not just individual houses that follow these rules. This is the village of Muka. It's been here since Viking times. Stone built with stone roofs. Windows not too big. All of the buildings huddled together for warmth. Snuggled in the hillside and built on the north side of the valley. Facing south to catch as much sunlight as possible. That's why it's managed to survive the weather up here in the hills for over a thousand years.
you catch me pulling out all of the stops to bring you yet another great show. I'm at Nunnikirk Hall, which is a school now, but which was built in 1825 by a great northern architect called John Dobson. The style is, well, it's partly Greek and partly Roman, which was the fashionable thing to do in 1825. The trouble with copying the Greeks and Romans is, well, you probably notice this, the more observant among you, but they have different weather to us. It gets warmer down there. So it was obviously necessary to adapt the old Mediterranean styles for use in this country. So how has this been adapted to cope with the British weather? Well, there's this dome. A real Roman house just had a nice open courtyard in the middle. Not totally practical here in the moisty moistland of Northumberland. I was a bit unfair before in Swaledale, suggesting that we only get bad weather up here in the north. Actually, I don't think we get bad weather at all, just different kinds of good weather. But we do get quite a range. Whew. And the big problem with building any house is coping with that range. We want our houses to be airy and comfy in the summer, but also warm and waterproof in the winter. You wouldn't expect clothes to be able to cope with a range like that, but that's what we demand from our houses. So how well does a house like this cope? Not badly, to be honest. It's a compromise, you never get perfection, but a Georgian house like Nunnikirk gets the balance pretty well right. Like the Swaledale houses, it's built of stone, which is very energy efficient. It warms up slowly, but it keeps its heat for a long time. And Dobson tried all sorts of things to make it more efficient. He invented a form of cavity walling, probably the first person to use it in British building. More important was the position of the house. Dobson liked to camp out on the sites of his houses so he could find out about the weather conditions. And here he sort of pushed the house over to the north side of the valley so that it's sheltered by the hillside. He's put the entrance round on the sheltered side as well, away from the prevailing winds, to cut down on the number of drafts in the house. The entrance is protected by a port cochere, a sort of big porchy thing which had two purposes. It acted as a sort of buffer between outside and inside, a sort of airlock, and it protected one as one descended from one's carriage on a nasty night. So that's the entrance, nicely protected around the side. While the main living rooms face south and west, so they get as much sunshine as possible. It's got big windows, of course, fabulous in summer, especially as they open entirely to let the inside of the house flow naturally into the garden. In 1825, people had an absolute passion for nature. I think that's perfect building for summer weather, when you wanted as much light and airiness as you could get. But then in winter, when you wanted nature to invade the inside of the house as little as possible, you could... Pull down these windows. You could open up these magnificent shutters and pull them across the window, draw the curtains, light the lights, snuggle down in front of the fire. What could be nicer? John Dobson died in 1860. And ever since then, people have been trying new materials and new building techniques. Flat roofs, concrete, steel frames meant that the outside walls of buildings didn't need to be thick and strong. It was okay just to hang thin cladding onto the frame. And above all, from the point of view of this programme, it became possible to make glass in bigger and bigger sheets. This has been, how shall I put it, not an unmixed blessing. It has its glories, of course, because light is a wonderful thing. But for a long time, architects don't seem to have known how to control the new technologies at their disposal. And as a result, it's been my lot, it's been lots of people's lots, to spend our working lives in some of the worst weather-designed buildings you could imagine. Schools. 1960s school buildings in particular have been my bete noire. 
I've taught in rooms filled with buckets because of leaking flat roofs. I've seen plate glass windows fall out on the heads of innocent pupils. Well, I withdraw the innocent. I'm not sure I've met many innocent pupils. Savage beasts. But every classroom is different. You're either on the south side of the building, in which case you're half baked and the class is grumpy, four of them have collapsed with heat stroke, three of them are stripped down to their bikinis, and that's just the boys. Or you're on the north side, freezing your buns off, and there hasn't been any sunshine in here since 1832. And you're at the end of the central heating line, and the radiator's cold, and the windows are ill-fitting. Oh, which is worse? I bet most of you have either worked or gone to school in places like that. So on all of our behalves, I'm going to call down the boot on all of those 20th century workplaces built by people who thought they were above the weather and didn't need to take it into consideration. There was an early 20th century movement to use weather to its full potential, and there's an example of that movement in Gateshead. It's called Joycey Road Open Air School, and it was opened in 1937. It was initially for children with TB. It was part of an outdoor educational movement which had started in Berlin early in the 20th century. People totally believed that fresh air was the best cure for TB, so all of the teaching was done in pavilions like this. Whenever possible, all of these windows were flung open to take full advantage of the glorious northeast sunshine. Okay, I know it must have been freezing sometimes, but I still think it was a lovely idea, and I think it's one of the rather forgotten architectural and educational jewels. It's, um, it's not being used in the same way anymore, but it belongs to Gateshead College, so it's still in educational use. Every aspect of the children's lives needed to take place in the fresh air. The dining room in the main hall was lined with windows in the same way as the classrooms. And you weren't even safe when you were in bed. In recent years, educational buildings have been very good at looking for new ways to respond to weather. The University of Northumbria in Newcastle built the first building in the country to be entirely clad with photovoltaic panels and to produce its own power directly from the sun in the northeast. How about that for the triumph of hope over reality? And this is Cassop in East Durham, which is on a hilltop and is therefore, as I can testify, a windy spot. So windy is it that the children in the local primary school have had to learn new ways of walking to cope with the weather. But they're clever here in Cassop and they have come up with a cunning plan, my lord. Build a windmill. Use the wind. Cassop's the first school in mainland Britain to produce its own wind power. When the schools go in full tilt, the windmill produces something between a third and a half of all its electrical needs. But of course, when the school's closed, the wind doesn't stop and go home for its tea in an early night, however much it might want to. So the windmill keeps on turning and sends the meter into reverse. Instead of using electricity, the school starts pumping it back into the national grid. Isn't that fantastic? And that's not all. This is another building with photovoltaic cells to provide even more green electricity. And on top of that, the school's central heating boilers are run on recycled wood pellets. I told you it was cunning. And finally, proof of how seriously people are taking weather nowadays when they design buildings. 
This is the Devonshire building at Newcastle University. It houses departments researching into all sorts of environmental and earth sciences, so you might expect it to be a bit cutting edge. It's designed to really use the local climate. And you know, that's a bit of a challenge when you're stuck in the middle of Newcastle. What does it have? Well, there are photovoltaic cells on the roof churning out volts whenever it's daylight, and the building is lit as much as possible by daylight, in fact. Not only are its electric lights lit by solar power, but there are all sorts of clever ways of getting as much natural light and warmth inside as possible. The most obvious is this climate-responsive facade on the south front, which opens and shuts depending on where the sun is and how strong it is, to optimise the levels of daylight and warmth inside. Inside, there's a full-height atrium which is naturally ventilated and heated by the sun. Passive solar heating, if you want to be posh. It lets light and heat into all of these inside rooms. It's all very clever. In fact, I haven't told you more than a fraction of its clevernesses. But if you can do all of that and still look good, then I think the least you deserve is a Grundy's wonder. <laughs>